we can continue. It's already a quarter after three, so whenever you want. Yeah, let, sure, let's, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, let me uh, share my, my screen. Um, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, okay, now, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, so it's recurrent neural networks uh, for quantum antibody physics. I'm, I'm gonna give you two examples of uh, research that I've done using RNNs, uh, one for quantum state reconstruction and then one for uh, variational annealing, which is uh, that idea that I just uh, explained roughly or not roughly, but like uh, closely related to the question I just answered, which is, um, so simulated annealing is a technique to solve uh, combinatorial optimization. It turns out um, that what you do is simply use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo uh, on this uh, problem Hamiltonians. And then what you do is you slowly uh, decrease the temperature. And, and then you hope that at the end, you find the ground state of the classical Hamiltonian, which is the solution to the problem. Um, but for challenging problems, this dynamics of the Monte Carlo, the Markov chain is very slow. So there's a chance that we can make progress with these models. And I'm gonna give you uh, an, an example of that. Uh, so let me start with the quantum state reconstruction, which is a little more involved. Um, so, oh, and before, uh, so this slide is in the wrong place, but um, so I wanted to mention that uh, last week we posted this paper, this uh, neural networks in quantum anybody physics, uh, hands-on tutorial, okay? And so we describe many of these techniques in that paper, uh, even the, res the recurrent neural network. Uh, but then the cool thing is we provided code um, that you can play with. It's very simple code, but it allows you to get started with all these ideas and so on. And um, so I encourage you to check this out. It has uh, all sorts of examples, variational Monte Carlo, uh, quantum state reconstruction. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so if you're interested and you wanna learn how to code this uh, things, then this is a good uh, starting point, hopefully. Um, so anyway, so let me go ahead with the uh, quantum state reconstruction. So what is uh, learning a quantum state and what is quantum state? Tomography. Uh, so it, uh, it's so it's the following. So quantum state tomography is the process of reconstructing the quantum state of a device by measurements. So you take a quantum system, uh, you measure it many many times, um, and then you try to infer what the quantum state is. Okay, uh, it is the gold standard for verification and benchmarking of quantum devices. Um, and it is useful to characterize, for instance, optical signals. Um, it's useful to diagnose and detect errors in quantum state preparation, for instance, states produced by a quantum computer. Uh, it can be used to detect entanglement and many more things. Uh, and the idea is that we need to go beyond uh, standard quantum state tomography reconstructions because um, there has been recent progress in controlling very large quantum devices, quantum systems. Um, there's also uh, availability of uh, arbitrary measurements that are performed with relatively high accuracy. And so the bottleneck becomes uh, progress in the estimation of these quantum states and the associated uh, cur curse of dimensionality. So this uh, quantum states, when we try to represent them in the classical computer, the if you want, uh, they uh, entail using uh, exponential resources in time and memory, okay? So, uh, so we need to go beyond standard quantum state tomography, which uses all uh, exponential resources. And this is an important um, uh, for the future of quantum simulations and the benchmarking of quantum computers and so on, and uh, quantum simulators. So I have here trapped ions on top, uh, Google um, uh, processor, D-Wave is a quantum computer, it's a quantum annealer. Um, and here I have cold atoms. So those are just examples of devices you may want to uh, say characterize through quantum state tomography. 
So this is uh, like the pace of growth. This is already a bit outdated, but uh, this is 51 uh, atoms quantum simulator, 53. Uh, this is 1,800. So this is, uh, I'm very proud of this. I, um, I, I participated in this one. Uh, and uh, quantum chemistry simulators and so on. There's lots of uh, exciting and um, uh, quantum simulations mostly that uh, are becoming available and uh, grow. And uh, so can we find ways or can we de de devise tools to benchmark this uh, state preparations? Uh, so what are the ingredients uh, uh, quantum system that you can prepare uh, repeatedly? So because as you know, when you produce a quantum state or as you may, you may have heard of it, uh, when you produce a quantum state, you measure it, you destroy the quantum state. So you, you have to be able to repeat the same experiment many, many times. And then you need some availability of measurements that you can apply, so a set of measurements. And then you need uh, a training procedure and a model, okay? So a training procedure is, um, you have a model for the quantum state, either a full representation of the density matrix or a matrix product state or a matrix product uh, operator, or even a neural network. And then a training procedure that, um, um, if you want, fits the measurements to this model, okay? Uh, and then at the end, you need a certification, kind of like uh, putting a stamp on the model you train, which is, uh, for instance, um, computation of the fidelity of the reconstruction with respect to an ideal state that you are trying to prepare in your quantum computer and so on. So a typical tomography protocol prepares many copies of the state and they're measured in multiple ways. Finally, the outcomes of those measurements are fit um, and produce an estimate of the quantum state raw start. Okay, that's the fitting part and uh, that's roughly how it goes. Um, so here's one example of um, how you do this in practice. So this is called maximum likelihood estimation because it's the same spirit of what I was discussing. So it requires uh, uh, computing some probability uh, and you use this li likelihood function that I discussed to fit a model. So what is this model? It's a physical density matrix in its most general uh, form. So meaning that it scales exponent, like the representation scales exponentially with the size of the system. But then what you do is you uh, you just you assume that the measurements are independent, which they are, um, and then you compute the probability of observing these outcomes in the experiment, and you maximize this probability. This is the so-called maximum likelihood principle that we discussed. Um, uh, and then you fit uh, the density matrix the, uh, to the data, okay? It has some issue, which is exponential scaling in the parameterization and uh, in the handling. So it's uh, the time uh, scaling of the processing of the algorithm is um, it's exponential, but this is the most reliable tool in the sense that um, uh, I, it's the most general tool, but scales poorly. So you cannot apply it beyond a handful of uh, qubits, say uh, 10 or 12 qubits, I think at most, um, as far as I know. And so you cannot apply it for this um, uh, large quantum simulator, okay? Then the question is how to make quantum state tomography efficient. And there are multiple ideas out there. So the most, um, one of the most interesting ones is uh, introduce a parameterization of the quantum state with good scaling, but non-trivial structure. Like for instance, you can use a matrix product state of, uh, or, or a matrix product operator, and then just do a reconstruction using this as your model for the quantum state. And this is, th these two are like one of the most powerful techniques is, um, based on uh, matrix product states and uh, matrix product operators. Um, however, there are uh, other approaches that we came up with, which is introduce a parameterization of the quantum state with good scaling. So it follows that same trend, uh, but use instead rest, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines or like neural networks in general, right? Um, so uh, this paper, which we co-authored a few years ago, we, uh, we used a restricted Boltzmann machine and we performed quantum state tomography. 
Okay. Uh, and this was extended later by uh, Giacomo Torlai and uh, Roger Melko, uh, and they uh, they uh, were able to introduce, if you want, a density operator that was in, written in terms of a neural network. Um, so this is uh, the reference three works for pure states with uh, good structure and it has good scaling in terms of the resources you need to uh, to use. And then this latent uh, space purification uh, approach handles mixed states, but has fast scaling. So it doesn't solve all the problems. Um, so today I want to tell you about an approach where we, so instead of parameterizing the quantum state directly, we parameterize the measurement uh, statistics of, uh, of a measurement, which is given uh, basically by Born rule. And to parameterize that uh, measurement statistics, so the probability distribution of the measurements, we use the RNN, okay? Mm, which is, I mean, the, the model that we discussed uh, earlier today. Uh, and then we use this idea to learn synthetic uh, states uh, so basically numerically generated experiments, uh, mimicking experimental data. So that's, that's the idea with, uh, with this whole approach. Um, so let me tell you how to do this, but before that, let's, uh, let me tell you this. So it works for uh, pure and mixed uh, states with uh, structure, meaning that uh, uh, it works for good. So it works well for quantum states that are well represented by a recurrent neural network. Uh, and it has good scaling in terms of the resources uh, and so on, as long as this uh, structure in the, in the quantum state. Now, which states can we represent with an RNN? Still a little bit of an uh, um, um, open question, but since RNNs are also uh, universal function approximators, there's hope that as you make the RNN powerful or more and more powerful, that you're able to capture more and more the, um, quantum states that are interesting uh, and so on. And the evidence that we have is that this RNN can represent uh, a reasonable um, uh, and non-trivial quantum state. So and I'm gonna show you examples of that. Uh, so let me remind you the setting. So, it's, uh, so we have a large quantum device. Uh, uh, we want to know if uh, it's working as intended. So we think this device can produce some non-trivial quantum states, and we want to certify that the system works in some simple uh, cases, right? Like, so we have this device, we, we, we ask the device produce some quantum state, like, I don't know, like a matrix product state. Um, and so we want to benchmark this preparation. This is uh, useful in, in the near term, because as um, quantum computers become stronger and stronger, they're gonna be producing quantum states that we cannot represent classically. That's the hope uh, uh, with quantum computing. By the, uh, 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 so th there's no hope that this is gonna be working forever, but um, that we're gonna be using it to benchmark um, near-term quantum computers or quantum devices. Uh, so let me dis discuss a little bit the theory behind what we're doing. So quantum states, measurements, and probability distributions. So a quantum state is traditionally described by a density matrix, which describes the statistical uh, state of a quantum system in quantum mechanics. Everything we can possibly know about a quantum state is encoded in the density matrix. So what is this density matrix? It's a positive semi-definite Hermitian matrix of trace one acting on the Hilbert space. Um, uh, this family forms a convex set uh, convex set meaning that all qu uh, possible quantum states form a convex set and for one qubit is the mm, block sphere. So it's this uh, sphere that we have here. In high dimensions, the shape of this convex set is not known, but, um, but it's known to be convex and, uh, and basically be similar to a sphere, like a deformed sphere. Um, so that's the traditional approach, but can we represent quantum states with uh, just probability? That's what I want to do, and uh, because I'm going to be using the RNN in its simplest uh, form to represent it. So, and the idea is you can do this through measurements. That's uh, that's why this is so natural for tomography, right? So, and measurements are described by uh, positive, uh, by, by some operators M, right? We call we call them positive operator value measures, and they're 
if you want descriptions of what you do in an experiment when you go and measure the, the quantum state. Okay, so there are this, uh, this POVMs are just that represent mathematical representations of what you do when you measure a quantum device, right? There are collections of um, positive semi-definite matrices with a measurement outcome index A. Okay, I, for instance, A could be, uh, if I measure along uh, like the spin along the uh, Z direction, then you get either up or down. So this index A is that index, right? Like is, it, is, it, is my measurement up or down if I measure, say, along the Z direction? And this uh, operator summed up to the identity, okay? So you go to the lab, you prepare the experiment so that you measure M and your device gives you uh, A, either up or down, for instance. So, so what is the relation uh, between experiments and uh, measurements? Is, is this expression here is called Born rule because Born basically came up with it, okay? So you have a quantum state you prepare in the lab row, you have a measurement uh, apparatus uh, that you use, you measure it, and then the probability that you observe A in the experiment is given by trace of rho times the, operate, the measurement operator, the POVM element um, A, and that gives you this probability. Okay, that's the probability that you observe either up or down, for instance, in the lab. Okay, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, if you want a fundamental link between quantum theory uh, which is the description of the quantum state row and the description of the measurement and what you see in the experiment, which is some probabilistic uh, outcome of, um, of the measurement. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce the so-called informationally complete uh, POVM, so informationally complete measurements. So, and what are these uh, informationally complete measurements? It's basically a measurement uh, or a set of measurements such that um, if you measure the, the quantum state with those with that apparatus, then you get all the information about the quantum state. And um, you can think of this as, as the following. Suppose you have like your quantum state is a, a I don't know, a three dimensional object. And then you, uh, you want to understand that object, right? Like, so for you to do that, you have to take this three dimensional shape and you have to see it from different directions for you to be able to see it entirely, right? Like to characterize its uh, shape, okay? So informationally complete measurements are that thing, right? Are like it's observing the quantum state from all possible directions such that you can determine what it is, right? Determine the quantum state. So there's an, I, I like this analogy, right? Like it's like observing um, uh, an object from multiple directions, uh, for instance, uh, uh, measurement that is not informationally complete for a 3D object is, I don't know, observing only along the X direction. That doesn't tell you what happens behind or above and so on, right? That, that's the idea. So informationally complete measurements are a set of measurements that allow you to see the quantum state in all possible directions such that you can throw a cartoon of, of this quantum state. That, that's how I, I think about this or the simplest way. But uh, or a simple way to, to, to think about it. So information and completeness means that um, the measurement statistics PA, which is beyond the observations, contains all the information about the quantum state. It also means the following. If you have a Hilbert space, then you can uh, span it with this uh, set of operators, right? Uh, meaning that um, you can write any operator O as a linear combination of this operators M, A. Um, the final meaning that I want to highlight is that the relation between rho and the probability distribution P can be inverted. So here we go from rho to P. If you have informationally complete measurements, typically you can invert you. So you can write rho in terms of P, the probability distribution, so that P becomes the quantum state if you want, okay? And that's what we exploit here. We exploit informationally complete measurements and we represent the quantum state in terms of this probability distribution PA. Um, so, so this is the inversion part. I don't want to go through the math, but the message is the following. Born rule tells us that you can go from the quantum state and the measurement to the probability distribution. If you have an informationally complete uh, uh, set of measurements, you can go the other way around, which is you can write rho in terms of um, the probability distribution P, okay? That's the key element. And then um, 
the expression is is this here, um, and what you what I have here in this representation is a tensor network representation of this expression, which is telling me that um, what we're doing here is factorizing rho in terms of probability distribution that is complicated, uh, and a set of uh, simple uh, product ten uh, of tensors that are very simple. They're factorized, right? So all the complexity and potential intractability of the quantum state gets, gets pushed into the probability distribution because that's what makes this distribution uh, not be, say, for instance, a, 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 a mean field, for instance. So all the interactions and all the entanglement gets uh, pushed into the probability distribution. And that's what we exploit. So what we do or the insight we had was we can create a, a, a representation of the quantum state in terms of a probability distribution over a, an informationally complete uh, set of measurements M, okay? And what we do is we use recurrent neural networks to represent this distribution P. And we know recurrent neural networks are very powerful. So that's what we use, right? So because they, at first they allow for exact sampling they have a tractable density. We can compute um, the probability of uh, configuration A. And, and we can use uh, maximum likelihood estimation, for instance, to learn the RNN if we have a data set of uh, experimental outcomes. That's the idea. And so what we do, or what we have here is uh, a, a model for the density matrix, raw model, that is uh, our, an RNN model here, which I call language model, this they're typically using in, in, in language uh, processing. And then you attach a set of uh, simple tensors that are tiny, okay? And that's our model for the density matrix for the quantum state. So, so let me recap what we do or what we would do in the lab. And we have done it actually in a recent paper, but so what we do is this, we prepare a quantum state repeatedly on a quantum device. Here's uh, Google's uh, processor or IBM's uh, quantum computer. We perform this measurement, this informationally complete measurement. Uh, this gives us a large collection of uh, measurement outcomes. So it, it's a big data set. Then we fit the recurrent neural network using maximum likelihood estimation, exactly what, um, what I explained in the first part of uh, today's uh, discussion in the morning or in my morning. Then we invert this density matrix. And I said, I, I use quote unquote, this is only a formal thing, inverting this exactly is exponentially difficult. So we don't do it, but we can do it in practice if we want, if we want for instance, to compute them. Um, say correlation functions over the quantum state and so on. Um, or if we want to compute say fidelity is uh, classical fidelity and so on. And then we perform some sort of uh, certification either through fidelity, classical fidelity or measuring correlate, like cor uh, correlation functions that are relevant for the system you're interested in. Okay, so that's what we did. So let me, uh, let me give you one example of uh, reconstructing some numerically generated quantum states. So, so here is a so-called pure G8 set state. So it's uh, the so-called cat state too. It's a superposition of uh, uh, all spins uh, uh, are 0, 0, 0, 0, plus all spins are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, okay? So that's this uh, cat state. Um, the density matrix is uh, this one here. And then we also introduce a model of noise because, uh, so this is a pure state, but we also want to explore whether we can represent a mixed uh, states, right? And so we, we use a model, a noise model, and this noise model is the following. So with probability P, we apply uh, an error on the quantum state where we, uh, with probability one third, we apply um, either sigma X, sigma Y, or sigma Z on the state. And with probability one minus P, we do nothing, okay? So that if probability P of introducing an error is zero, then we are back to the pure state. But if we make P large, then we have a completely mixed uh, state, okay? That's the idea. So 
can we reconstruct these quantum states using a recurrent neural network? That's the question. And here's like uh, learning all. It. So this is two qubits. Um, uh, and uh, we apply measurements for different values of noise. Um, and then uh, we train this model, so I like, so in here I'm using a restricted Boltzmann machine first as a first example. Uh, and this is the KL divergence, which is basically the difference or the distance, if you want. it's not exactly a distance, but a divergence between uh, the model distribution and the, and the exact probability distribution of the measurement outcome. And this is as a function of uh, training, as we train these models with um, using maximum likelihood principle for maximum likelihood estimation. And what we see uh, is that um, uh, as we train the model, this uh, distance or this divergence goes to zero uh, for the different values of uh, noise P0 all the way through uh, P1, okay? And so we successfully uh, train this model. What we see is that um, training the distribution uh, is harder for low values of noise, but easy for large values of noise, which makes sense because when you have high values of noise, this is basically a constant distribution. It's a completely random, um, a completely uh, flat distribution. So it's very easy to learn. There's nothing to learn. It's just one parameter. So this is the easiest to learn. So it goes to zero faster. Whereas for low values of noise, it takes some effort, right? Like, um, so this is the KL, this is for the fidelity, uh, which is basically the overlap between these two distributions, which uh, goes to one um, as you train. And then finally, we have the quantum fidelity, uh, which is the distance between the quantum states itself. And uh, it, it follows the same trend, right? Like it goes to one as you train the models meaning that everything is working. However, this was only for two qubits and it was difficult to scale it uh, to more than three or four qubits. So we, we said, how about we try something else? And we tried the RNN. And uh, for the RNN, we were able to go up to uh, 80 or 90, I think 100 qubits, which was pretty surprising. So we were very happy. And we thought this was very uh, strong, uh, result uh, so that the RNN is capable of representing these quantum states in this form, like using probability. And what we have here is um, a function, like a classical fidelity as a function of um, the number of experimental uh, outcomes that we use in the reconstruction. And uh, what we see is that uh, for uh, small values of noise, then you, 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 you see that as you add more and more data, you, uh, you get a better and better reconstruction, right? You get higher and higher fidelity. And what we also see is that um, for high values of noise, it, you need less and less data for the same reason uh, that uh, learning a flat distribution is cheap, it's easy, right? Uh, you need fewer data points. The interesting thing is that um, for you to get a, a high, uh, classical fidelity, say for a value of 0 0.95, you only need a number of samples n uh, star that scales roughly linearly with the size of the system n. So this is the number of qubits. So in that sense, this approach is, um, I mean, it has some scalability properties that are, um, that are mild, right? Uh, in the sense that if you're trying to use this, um, so-called classical fidelity, you can achieve high uh, reconstruction accuracy with moderate resources, okay? And this is in part due to the fact that you were using this RNN, which is very powerful, and that we can represent many important distributions with it. Uh, now we moved on to uh, ground states of local Hamiltonian. So this was all for the GH set, but then we wanted to explore uh, if we wanted to, if we could reproduce ground states of, uh, many body Hamiltonians. And so this is uh, for 50 spins, uh, we uh, use DMRG, the uh, matrix product state, and we find that, uh, uh, that we can also reconstruct these ground states pretty accurately. So this is uh, the, the orange curve is uh, synthetic data. So coming from density matrix renormalization group, expectation value of sigma set, uh, sigma x as a, as a function of the site. 
And what we see is that uh, our reconstruction matches, like the correlation functions of the reconstruction match uh, pretty well the, uh, the, the synthetic data, okay? And this is for two body correlation functions, sigma one, sigma i along the z direction. And again, we see a good uh, agreement. Then, um, then we have uh, a little bit more, more complicated model, which is the Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice, which, I mean, it's an interesting model in that um, it has a complicated sign structure, right? Like a, this is a model whose wave function is not known and, uh, and we know it has a complicated sign structure. And uh, we wanted to see if we could represent that um, ground state with only probability, which is what we're doing. And so that's why we picked this example. So this is on a uh, eight by eight uh, lattice and these are correlation functions of the synthetic state, namely the ground state of the Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice. And these are the reconstructions. So, and it seems to be working uh, really, really well. Um, uh, so, yeah, so that's it. So using the RN, so kind of to conclude, so using the RNN was important um, for the success of the method because of its tractable likelihood and the fact that we can exactly sample them, okay? As we, as I highlighted. Uh, if there are any questions, um, that's now it's a good time to discuss. No questions, so maybe I can go ahead. Yes. Okay, so that was it for uh, reconstructing quantum states. Now let me tell you about something newer. So this, uh, oh, there was a question. To... Oh, so can you explain why we can get exact sampling? Oh yeah, so the, the this is from Kazuki. So can we? How can we get exact sampling? Is because this RNN is constructed um, by parameterizing all the conditionals in a probability distribution, P sigma one, two, three, uh, two N. So what we do is we, uh, the model parameterizes each of the conditionals, meaning that we parameterize P of um, sigma one, uh, and then P of uh, sigma two condition on sigma one, uh, sigma three condition on uh, sigma one and sigma two and so on. So if we have all a specification of all those conditionals, then you can use uh, the, conditional at one to get a sample of uh, P sigma of sigma one, then you can feed that into the uh, conditional for sigma two, and you can sample that conditional. Uh, and then you take sigma one and sigma two, and then you compute the conditional on sigma three, and so on until you exhaust um, all n spins. And so since you have access to all those conditionals, which is true by construction, then this, as an exact sample of the model. And then um, that's why you can, uh, just by, because of the construction of the model, okay? Which uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's very important. Uh, okay, so if there are no other uh, questions, oh, there's one more. Uh, so this is for, from Robertson. How does the measurement MA comes in the example of uh, calculating uh, ground states of Hamiltonians. Yeah, so that's a good question. So it comes in, in the following form. So what we do is we prepare, uh, so we imagine we're preparing this quantum state, right, uh, in a device. And then we measure the, um, we measure this device or this quantum state that is the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And then uh, we collect the uh, statistics and then we reconstruct the quantum state. So we use basically the, the measurement outcomes of those measurement operators M to train, okay? The, 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 the RNN model in these examples too. I hope that answers the question. Um, then let me go ahead with one more, uh, Apollinario. So can Fisher information be used as an alternative measure for UVM? Um, that I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Um, it could be, but uh, I'll have to think about it. All right, let me go ahead. Mm. 
Um, okay, so let me go ahead with the next. Uh, so this is new uh, from a couple of weeks ago. So it's variational neural annealing. So let me introduce this uh, um, idea of combinatorial optimization. So many, many important uh, challenges in science and technology can be cast as optimization problems, right? So there are famous uh, optimization problems that are that we use uh, like an, to motivate this, but um, say traveling salesman problem, nurse uh, scheduling problem, vehicle routing problems, spacecraft scheduling, uh, circuit design, mm, discovery of the Higg boson. Um, all those can be recast or the data analysis of this experiments or this problems can be recast as, uh, as an optimization, okay? And these are computationally very difficult problems. It turns out that many of these uh, problems can be formulated as finding the ground state of a classical easing Hamiltonian that I call H target, okay? So this is the expression. So this uh, sigma, I sigma, J variables are just basically plus or minus one. Um, and uh, this is extremely general. Like many, many, many problems can be uh, cast as finding the ground state of this. And what is the ground state of, um, of this Hamiltonian is finding the spin configuration sigma i um, that minimizes the energy or this ground state, this uh, energy or this Hamiltonian, okay? Um, but uh, finding these uh, solutions is extremely hard for some problems, right? So there are heuristic methods to do it. And one of them that I really like is called simulated annealing. Uh, so what is simulated annealing? So it kind of like uh, inspired by uh, old technique. So it mirrors the analogous annealing process in material science and metallurgy where a crystalline solid is heated. So you warm up a piece of metal like a sword and, and then you slowly cool it down. And as you cool it down, this uh, piece of metal finds uh, its lowest uh, energy and uh, most uh, structurally stable crystal arrangement, which makes the material really durable and hard. And this is actually used in like, when people build uh, weapons and swords, okay? So, uh, and so people took uh, in the 80s, they took inspiration from this uh, metallurgic technique to devise a way, an approach to solve combinatorial problems of this form, basically finding the ground state of an easing Hamiltonian. And so uh, what they did was they defined this uh, simulated annealing because it's not real annealing. You don't heat up your computer or anything. You uh, basically simulate annealing um, and explore this optimization problems, energy landscape by a gradual decrease in thermal fluctuations. But these thermal fluctuations are generated by, by Monte Carlo, by the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. So basically what you do is you take this Hamiltonian and you simulate it using Monte Carlo, okay? And then what you do is you slowly uh, tune, uh, cool down the temperature of the simulation, okay? So you decrease the temperature uh, little by little until you, uh, you reach the temperature to zero and then at zero temperature, you should be seeing only configurations that are consistent with the ground state of the target Hamiltonian, okay? Uh, that's the idea with uh, simulator annealing. It provides a fundamental connection between thermodynamics and the behavior of physical system but with complex optimization problems. So I think this is very appealing and a very beautiful uh, algorithm. The problem with simulated annealing is sampling the Boltzmann distribution using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo or Metropolis Hastings algorithm becomes very slow for hard optimization problems as you cool down, as you make this temperature uh, too uh, low. And the, this is because the autocorrelation of the Markov chain becomes very large, okay? So finding solutions to these problems becomes very expensive because you have to wait for a very, very long time. Okay, and this is a schematic uh, cartoon of what happens, right? Like, so what you do is, so this is a simplex, so the space of probability distributions. Um, and so what you do is you start at very high temperature somewhere here. And if you did uh, annealing at a very, very slow speed, you would follow a path that connects infinite temperature with zero temperature 
Uh, so this is if you want to say exact Boltzmann distribution at um, all those steps. And then you solve the problem exactly, uh, which like the solution is either like, for instance, for a degenerate problem, you, you, you find this configuration or this configuration. So that's if you do it very slowly. However, if you do simulated annealing, which is you do a Markov chain Monte Carlo, this Markov chain would go out of equilibrium, okay? So that I represent here, and then you get stuck somewhere here, and you end up with uh, some approximate solutions, maybe good, maybe bad, okay? Now, that's what happens with simulated annealing. Now, what we're proposing is, here's one idea. So replace annealing uh, and approximately sampling the exact Boltzmann distribution by annealing an approximate uh, distribution that is close to the Boltzmann distribution, like a, an RNN, uh, that can be sample efficient. So there's no autocorrelation. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, and then um, this may or may not lead to better solutions. So that, that that's a, that's why this method is heuristic. But um, what we find is that um, this approximation to the Boltzmann distribution that we uh, we compute with the RNN is a better approximation to the exact Boltzmann distribution. And so it means that you can get uh, better solutions than simulated annealing by uh, using the RNN because of uh, the fact that you can get exact samples without autocorrelation. Okay, so that's the idea. And this was um, posted on the archive a few, few weeks ago. Uh, and so let me let me show you one example of uh, uh, solving optimization problems with this uh, technique. Uh, but before doing that, let me uh, like tell you how we train this RNN, so how we optimize them. So how to train this RNN so that it mimics the Boltzmann distribution. That's what we want to do, and then anneal in temperature. So we use a time-dependent uh, free energy, um, and then the the nice thing is we'll have uh, an energy part. This is the target Hamiltonian. We have a time dependent temperature, which is kind of like this temperature that allows us to go from high temperature to low temperature, and then the entropy. That's going to be our cost function, the thing that we optimize. And then we start at high temperature T0 and use a, a, a linear schedule function T such that uh, as we make T small t larger and larger, all the way uh, from 0 to 1, we end up at the ground state of the and then what we do is we optimize this free energy, okay? So what is the algorithm? We perform a warm up at high temperature where we make the uh, RNN match the high temperature distribution. Then we, uh, we do small time steps and we retrain the model um, at each temperature, okay? And we use uh, the variational parameters from the previous step um, on the model at the next uh, time step, t plus delta t, OK? Then at the end of the annealing process, this distribution given by the RNN is expected to assign high probability to the configurations that solve the optimization problem. So that's the, that's the strategy. Um, and uh, so this is th these are the results. So let me highlight, for instance, figure A. So this is for a spin glass problem with um, I think with 100 spin, it's called the Sherrington, Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And it's a, it's a fully connected spin glass problem. So it's deemed to be challenging. And what we find is that as we make uh, the number of annealing steps, meaning the time we take from uh, high temperature to uh, low temperature, what we see is that the residual energy, right? Like, so it, meaning the energy, the excess energy with respect to the exact solution to the problem uh, goes uh, goes to very small numbers, basically uh, around 10 to the minus six um, for variational uh, simulated annealing. So basically for our technique, which is this thing in blue, okay? And it does so at a faster rate than traditional simulated annealing, which is this red uh, curve here, and even uh, simulated quantum annealing, which is also a powerful, uh, uh, method in, inspired by quantum uh, by quantum annealing, uh, actually, uh, and we find that this technique is like our technique is significantly better if you put a lot of annealing steps. Um, so this is for the Sherrington uh, Kirkpatrick model, and this is for a so-called uh, Wisher planted ensemble. 
It's also a fully connected uh, spin glass. This one is very interesting and very difficult to solve. But we also find that our method, if we allow um, um, enough annealing steps, we find solutions that are orders of magnitude more accurate than uh, simulated annealing as well as uh, simulated quantum annealing. And, and this is, again, one more example of um, the Wisher planted ensemble, where we also find, I mean, we, saw, we find better solutions, but uh, not as, uh, as accurate as, uh, as in this two other examples. Um, and with that, uh, let me conclude and take a few questions. So we introduced a formulation of the quantum state that is closer to uh, statistical theory because we represented the quantum state in terms of uh, probability. Um, we use that representation to reconstruct uh, quantum states of uh, uh, increasingly large uh, sizes. And so uh, it provides a way to approximately reconstruct this quantum state. And then for the final part, we introduce a variational formulation of uh, simulated annealing that produces very accurate solutions to spin glass problems and may have applications in all these um, areas. And just uh, to conclude, I have this personal belief this, that there are a lot of opportunities at the intersection between physics, condensed matter physics, and machine learning. And, with that, let me take a uh, question. Thank you, Juan. Uh, so yes, you, you have two questions already. Okay. Um, hi, dear. Is it possible to get the slides of these courses? Yeah, I can send my slides to the organizers and then we will post it in the web page of the of the event. Okay. And then um, there's a question by Yusuf. Uh, could we use variational annealing to construct states uh, ensembles in a quantum in case of quantum steering? So I don't, I'm not familiar with quantum steering. So can you explain it to me? Maybe we can allow user to, to speak. Yusuf, do you want to talk? Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Juan, for the for the presentation. Uh, the quantum steering is uh, is a correlation between the null locality and the entanglement, and uh, it used it is it's used to to uh, to, to secure the the communication, the quantum communication. Uh, I am understand understand under, could you understand me or I need to clarify. I, I think I want to understand what's uh, what is it that you want to do? I, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. And, yeah. So uh, what um, the case when when we have uh, the case of entanglement, we have uh, two trustable uh, parties if we for example uh, Bob and Alice but uh, the, in the case of steering uh, we have we don't trust uh, one of them so Bob sent their states and uh, or Alice sent send, uh, send their states and uh, Bob need need to check them and need to construct and uh, to construct the state and uh, Maybe we we use we use uh, in the normal case we use uh, the semi-definite programmation if uh, if you if to optimize the state that uh, Alice is send it to Bob. Mm -hmm. So yeah, could we, could, we, could we replace the state uh, the the the, the semi semi uh, semi-definite uh, programming by by the variational uh, method? And yeah, even. so I, I think I now understand. So I think that as long as you for, you can formulate this uh, problem as a, as a combinatorial optimization or as a finding the uh, the solution as finding the ground state of a classical Hamiltonian, then you can use it. Thank you very much. Is, well, yeah, yes. the question is, can can you reformulate it that way? And if yes, then you can. Thank you. Okay. There's a question from Giancarlo. So can you study metastable uh, states? 
local minima and free energy barriers and characterize the free energy landscape with, uh, with this variation. So I think uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think yes, right? Like you can try to do that. The problem is, uh, or the problem that I see is you may, um, you may, uh, so the training, so the optimization of the free energy may fail, okay? And uh, there's, there's no easy way to check for that. But uh, I, 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 we, with my student, we think there's a way to solve uh, this issue of like a drop, a mode dropping, which is basically mi uh, missing some of the local minimum. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the method itself doesn't guarantee that you would find all the modes of the distribution or that it's going to explore all the, um, uh, like the entire landscape. But I know people have tried this, for, uh, like this, perhaps this style of um, approaching this problem using machine learning. So there's, I think there is hope and uh, there's potential to approach this uh, type of problems with these techniques with uh, annealing. Thanks. Okay, there is a question also in the chat. Uh, oh. Could you share references for and source for spin glass solution with variational SA? Uh, let me uh, in the chat. I did. I didn't uh, hear very well, but let me. Okay. Um, let me read it again. Um, could you share reference and source? Um, so the reference is. Um, let me share again. Um, so the reference we have is, is this. So archive 2101, uh, 10154. And the source we have not released it yet, but we'll, we will do it. OK. However, this is very easy to code. So if you go to the. hands-on tutorial, there's an RNN already there and you can change. So this is basically a loop over like the simulated variational simulator annealing is just a loop over uh, different temperatures when you try to optimize the free energy, which is easy to compute. Um, and so there's plenty of um, code that is available to do this and even in this hands-on tutorial, there's already code to do it. Um, but uh, but we'll, we'll eventually release our code in, in here for spin glass. Um, any more questions? Yes. There is another question in the Q&A. Yeah, so Robertson asked, I'm not sure if I missed it, but how do you verify results thrown out by the algorithm, for instance, in the spin glass problem? So, and this is a good question. So for the spin glass problem, so for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick, we use uh, the so-called spin glass server. So there's a server, I think this is in Germany, Ulich, where you just give them the problem Hamiltonian and they give you the answer. They use some heuristics and they, they tell you, yes, the this is the answer, or like they tell you, we cannot solve it, either because it's too big or there's no uh, heuristic to do it. And so for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, we use the spin glass uh, server. And for the Wisher uh, ensemble, so the Wisher ensemble is very interesting. It's a, it's a fully connected uh, spin glass problem with uh, so-called planted solutions. And planted solutions, what that means is that uh, uh, the solution is known to you by construction. So it's kind of like uh, finding a needle in the haystack where you know what the needle looks like. It's just that the needle is surrounded by uh, straw, by, uh, by a big bunch of like a uh, haystack. And so the, the, the energy of uh, the straw or the haystack, they're very, very similar, really close in energy to the energy of the needle. 
okay? But you know what the needle is, so you know the solution. So you don't. So that. So the way you verify the uh, solution given by the um, VCA, but the variational simulated annealing, is because you know the exact solution. You're just trying to find it um, in a say rough landscape uh, of uh, similar states surrounding it. Thank you. But what if? Uh, what if we don't have that known solutions? Then you just um, uh, hope for the best. Yeah. Many of these problems have no no known solution. I mean, if we did, then there wouldn't there wouldn't be problems. Right? Like uh, they won't be optimization problems. You just knew the solution, then, uh, but. For many of these problems, what you do is you try and you find the best energy you can, and then you take it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's how, how it works for some of these problems. There are bounds for some algorithms. So some algorithms can tell you you're this far um, from the real ground state, but uh, not all of them. So in, the, in our case, this doesn't tell you, um, it doesn't give you any guarantee. It's a heuristic. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can finish here. We have plenty of time, so if people want to ask you yet, but if not, thank you again, Juan. Yeah, was, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, next time you came pleasure. here, <laughs> I hope we so. Yeah. Trieste. <laughs> and that's all. Uh, well, uh, I don't know, Asia, do you want to say something for concluding this series of <laughs> machine learning? Yeah, I hope it was uh, very useful for all the participants. And, uh, it was definitely useful for me because I'm not uh, working too much on the subject. And so, yeah, thanks to Juan and to all the previous speakers and uh, tutors also. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me. And yeah, it was fun. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see each other in the future somehow. I learned a lot. I, I learned a lot, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. So yeah. Thanks. We conclude. Let's stop here. Yeah. Bye. Bye.